Hi, welcome to Chapter 5, Learning. Our objectives is we're going to discuss the meaning of the term learning, describe and explain the origins of classical conditioning, define conditioned emotional responses, and describe the theory of operant conditioning and how it differs from classical conditioning. Uh, we're going to look at the contributions of Thorndike and Skinner. Different, we'll be able to differentiate between primary and secondary reinforces, reinforcers uh, of the processes of positive and negative reinforcement. We'll be able to distinguish among the schedules of reinforcement. We'll be able to compare and contrast punishment and describe the role of opera and stimuli, describe how opera and conditioning is used to change animal and human behavior, define and explain the concept of latent learning, and explain the concept of insight learning and the concept of learned helplessness. Finally, we'll describe the process of observational learning, list the, list the four elements of observational learning, and provide and describe an example of conditioning in the real world. Um, there's an optional video on how have you used reinforcement to motivate change in behavior. Um, one thing about learning, if we had not been able to learn, we would have died out as a species long ago. Um, learning is involving altering our behavior that leads to survival and rewards. So what is learning? It's any relatively permanent change in behavior brought about by experiences or practice. When people learn anything, some part of their brain is physically changed to record what they have learned. Any type of change in the way an organism behaves is called learning. For instance, uh, that whatever you learn is stored in memory, which we'll cover in our next unit. Um, but if you touch a hot stove, you will associate that behavior with pain. And if you're smart, you'll avoid that behavior in the future. That's called learning. Now, Ivan Pavlov uh, was the first to really um, look into research on learning. Um, he f coined the term classical conditioning. Uh, he was a Russian physiologist who studied the workings of the body, who discovered classical conditioning through his work on digestion in dogs. He noticed when he, uh, whenever he, f he brought the bowl of food out to the dog, the dog started salivating before um, he started eating. Just seeing the bowl of food would cause the dog to salivate. Now salivation is, is a non-voluntary response. In other words, it just automatically happens and bringing out the bowl would create that response. Now in classical condition, he learned to make that response to a stimulus other than the original natural stimulus. So he was able to get the dog to salivate with the sound of a metronome, which he introduced every time he brought out the food for the dog. Okay. Now if you look at this interactive figure, it'll on your regular PowerPoint, you can there's the interactive figures are all optional, but it can it kind of walk you through the experiment. Um, for instance, uh, what, before conditioning, if you would play a metronome, the dog would not respond in salivation like he would when he saw a bowl of food. Um, next, he would introduce, he would play the metronome and then introduce the food, and the dog would salivate like he was before. Now, after doing this conditioning for over time, um, he learned that if he just played the metronome without the food, the dog would still salivate. So he was able to create a, uncondi uh, a conditioned response, an involuntary response on the dog um, without bringing out the food by playing this metronome, by pairing this metronome with every time he brought out food. So before conditioning takes place, the sound of the metronome does not cause salivation. It's a neutral stimulus, or NS. During conditioning, the sound of the metronome occurs just before the presentation of the food, and that's called the unconditioned stimulus, UCS. The food causes salivation, that's the UCR, unconditioned response. When conditioning has occurred after several pairings of the metronome with the food, the metronome will begin to elicit a salivation response from the dog without the food. This learning and the sound of the metronome is now a conditioned stimulus, and the salivation to the to the uh, metronome is called a conditioned response. Now, to explain these concepts again, unconditioned stimulus is a naturally occurring stimulus, so that the dog's um, salivating is unconditioned stimulus. Okay. Um, 
the unconditioned response is an involuntary response to a naturally occurring or unconditioned stimulus. I'm sorry, the food was an unconditioned stimulus. The salivating is an unconditioned response. The conditioned stimulus is that which which becomes able to produce a learned reflex response. So the learned stimulus was the metronome, which caused the the unconditioned response. Okay. The conditioned response is a learned reflex response to a conditioned stimulus. So, for instance, uh, every time um, the conditioned stimulus, if you hear the ice cream truck, uh, a conditioned response may be salivation because, you know, you're going to have some ice cream soon. Um, this is another chart that kind of shows the same thing. Um, and this shows another experiment. Um, that it was taken on by uh, Watson. Let's get the one here. Okay. Um, if uh, Watson used infants and had an unconditioned stimulus of a loud noise, notice the infant was startled. And so what he did is he conditioned, he paired a loud noise with uh, seeing a bunny rabbit, which normally didn't cause a style startling re result paired the bunny rabbit with the loud noise, caused the baby to startle after so much conditioning. All he had to do is show the bunny rabbit and the infant would have the startle response, the same as when the infant experienced a loud noise. Same thing with the car crash. Um, whenever, if you're ever in a car crash, um, the, the sound of it can cause a racing heart because it brings back uh, memory. So let's say you have squealing brakes, Sound of a car crash brings racing heart. Um, so maybe after that experience, all you need is a sound of squealing brakes can cause a racing heart by pairing those two things together. Okay, next is uh, acquisition, which is a repeated pairing of the, um, the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. The organism is in the process of acquiring learning. So although classical conditioning happens quite easily, there are a few pr basic principles that researchers have discovered. First of all, the conditioned stimulus, like the metronome or the showing the bunny, must come before the unconditioned stimulus of bringing the food or the loud noise. The conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus must come very close together in time. Ideally, um, they occur only several seconds apart. If it's more than five seconds apart, the the experiment won't work. So it's important that those things happen. Uh, next is a continue, the conditioned stimulus is usually some stimulus that's distinctive or stands out from other competing stimuli. So it has to be something that's different than other things that are going on. Um, stimulus generation, generalization is a tendency to respond to a stimulus that's only similar to the original conditioned stimulus with the conditioned response. For instance, um, Pavlov um, did not give any food after similar sounds, but the dog stopped responding to the fake sounds altogether. So Pavlov, instead of giving a metronome sound, gave something similar, and he found out that dogs, the dog would still salivate. Okay, But he didn't give any reinforcement for those things. And what he found out is the dog was able to tell the difference of the metronome sound and the similar sound, and the dog would only salivate towards the metronome sound. So the dog could discriminate between which sound led to getting food. Cool stuff, huh? Um, next is a uh, discriminant. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't click it right. Extinction. This is the next term where um, the disappearance or weakening of a learned response following a removal or absence of the unconditioned stimulus uh, in classical conditioning or removal of reinforcer. This happened when Pavlov stopped giving food after that conditioned stimulus. Um, so eventually the condi conditioned response died out and that leads to extinction. So if um, the, the sound of the metronome would play and he stopped giving food, eventually the dog would stop salivating because he, the, the behavior had become extinct, it died out, and the dog was no longer expecting food after hearing that sound. So this shows um, the charts 
um, of where Pavlov was introducing food paired with the uh, metronome sound. And it, as the dog kind of learned that connection, um, he would salivate more frequently um, towards hearing the sound of the, the metronome. When he stopped um, pairing the sound of the metronome sound um, with food, eventually the, the behavior died out. The dog would stop salivating to the sound of the metronome because food did not come with it. Um, and then he went through a few periods of days where nothing would happen. But then all of a sudden he started introducing the metronome sound right before the food came. And the dog quickly relearned the process of salivation upon hearing the sound of the metronome. And then um, again, when he stopped reinforcing that behavior, the salivation behavior uh, became extinct. Um, spontaneous recovery is the reappearance of that learned behavior after extinction has occurred. And that's what that chart showed. Um, and so basically learning is a permanent change in behavior. So the dog was familiar with it and he was able to, um, to do that. Uh, let's see. So this is higher order conditioning. And this is where the dog uh, pairs the, the metronome, the salivation. Um, and then with a, a different sound that was different than the first in the metronome, it still caused salivation. Okay. Um, in this chart down here. So in stage one, the strong salivation response is conditioned to occur to the sound of the metronome, um, CS1. In stage two, the finger snapping, CS2, is immediately paired with the ticking of the metronome. Until the dog begins to salivate to the finger snapping alone, this is called higher order conditioning because one condition stimulus is used to create another um, higher condition stimulus. So the pairing of the metronome and the snapping um, actually led to eventually the snapping leading to the dog salivating. Stimulus substitution is original theory in which Pavlov stated that classical conditioning occurred because the conditioned stimulus became a substitute for the unconditioned stimulus by being paired closely together. Cognitive perspective um, is well as developed where modern theory in which classical conditioning is seen to occur because the conditioned stimulus provides information or an expectancy about the coming of the unconditioned stimulus. In other words, why does classical conditioning work? Um, it has to be paired with uh, the conditions, unconditioned stimulus. It has to be introduced before um, the con unconditioned stimulus. So they had to pair the, the metronome sound before giving food, and then that caused the, the unconditioned response to be a conditioned response whenever they brought it, started the metronome. Now, a conditioned emotional response is that has become classically conditioned to occur to a learned stimuli. For instance, uh, if a person has a fear of dogs, there's emotional reaction occurs when, um, or they, they has emotional reaction when they see the dog. There's also emotional reaction when one sees an attractive person. Uh, those are conditioned emotional responses. Um, these conditional emotional responses can lead to phobias or rational fear responses. Um, there's a good video here using classical conditioning to treat um, disorders. Um, an important thing to keep in mind here is, um, for instance, uh, some kids who have school phobia. Uh, the moment they walk into school, they start, they pair that walking in school with their heart beating and, and getting nervous. And um, what they do is um, you can use classical conditioning um, to treat someone to not be afraid of coming to school. For instance, um, they could teach a, a student to be aware of their physical reaction when they walk into the school, heart beating fast. Uh, it's preparing their body for fight or flight. Uh, what they do is they teach a student that what's happening is not necessarily a bad thing. It also happens when you run really fast. Uh, eventually, you can calm yourself down. So they, they teach a student to relaxation exercise, to learn to calm themselves down, to know that, no, they're not in danger. Their life is not in danger. They calm themselves down physically, and so they no longer associate walking into school with that anxiety and high stress. 
Um, this is an example of a, a little Albert, um, who's an infant, who had been conditioned to fear a white rat. Um, and uh, this was a little study by, by Watson. And um, he also demonstrated the fear of a rabbit, a dog, a sealskin coat. And although it remains uncertain whether stimulus generation actually occurred, this fear was um, to a single rabbit, a single dog. Uh, can you think of any emotional reactions you might experience um, that might be classically conditioned emotional responses? Like, are you afraid of a dog or anything like that? Now, um, one thing I want you to know about this is that um, no ethics committee today would approve an experiment where an infant experiences psychological stress. Um, there's even some theories about um, this infant uh, was actually the child of uh, the wet nurse in the hospital, and that child didn't live past six years old. Um, they they really don't know who that, you know, the, so they can't really follow up to see if that child was um, emotionally disturbed from all those uh, uh, experiments. But this shows uh, the conditioned emotional response. Uh, let's say you get bit by a dog and your reaction is being frightened. Uh, now when you see a dog, you start thinking about being bit and so you, you have anxiety and you're frightened. Um, so now any sight of a dog causes a racing heart. That's a conditioned response. Here's another condition, unconditioned uh, stimulus, uh, being frightened. Um, about, you know, about it being kiss, you get a kiss and you have like a, it's not really frightened, you'd have a racing heart. That's, I need to fix that. Um, the sight of the significant other, uh, you know, leads to a kiss and causes a racing heart. Now, every time you see your significant other, you have a racing heart, uh, whether or not you get the kiss. That's classical conditioning, classical emotional response. Um, vicarious conditioning is classical conditioning of a reflex response or emotion by watching the reaction of another person. For instance, uh, do you remember uh, standing in line waiting to get your vaccination at school? And if you see the reflex response of other people, the kids in the back of the line are usually upset and anxious and crying because they were conditioned to other people's reaction of um, the shock shot in the arm. The conditioned taste aversion is a development of nausea aversive response to a particular taste because the taste was followed by a nausea reaction. Now psychologists are not sure if this is one of our um, instinctual type behavior um, where we pair food sources with uh, illness um, and it naturally creates a, uh, an aversion. Um, I mean, think about something you ate before you got sick and now you don't like that food anymore. Uh, I wonder if that was, you know, if this is more instinctual type behavior. Okay, taste aversion is biological preparedness. There's a tendency of animals to learn certain associations, such as taste and nausea, and only a few, one or few pairings, and um, th that animal learns really fast uh, not to eat that food anymore. Um, so that so pairing certain foods with illness would create a natural aversion. Now, operant conditioning is uh, different than classical conditioning. Um, it has to do with uh, the learning of voluntary behavior through effects of pleasant and unpleasant consequences to responses. Thorndike um, is one of the first people. Edward Thorndike's uh, Law of Effect, um, which came out around 1911, um, he learned, he posted it, or posed it, posited if a response is followed by a pleasurable consequence, it will tend to be repeated. If a response is followed by an unpleasant consequence, it will tend not to be repeated. Okay. So in other words, if there's a positive outcome, it's going to increase the behavior. If there's a negative outcome, it'll most likely decrease the behavior. Uh, so show this graph um, of a of a learning experience. Let me go to the next page here. Um, there was a cat, he had an experiment where there was a cat in a box. And um, there was a puzzle, it's a uh, classical puzzle box where there's a lever. And when the cat pushed, um, and, and when the cat pushed the lever, the cat was released 
Um, and then, not only that, there was food outside the box, which reinforced the cat even more. And it shows the time in seconds uh, that it took for the cat to push the lever to be escaped and receive food. And then they put the cat back in there, and it, there was a lot less time the second time to escape and get food. And I guess the cat wasn't as hungry there. It took a little longer. But after that, the number of trials was, it was a lot shorter time uh, for the cat to push a lever and be set free. So this is one of the earliest learning curves in history of the experimental study of conditioning. The time required by one of Thorndike's cats to escape from the puzzle box gradually decreased with trials, but with obvious reversals. Now Skinner was one who followed up after uh, Edward Thorndike, and um, he was a behaviorist. In other words, he wanted to study only behavioral, measurable behavior as opposed to the psychoanalysts who were looking at unconscious um, traumatic events um, of the past. Um, he gave the term operant conditioning its name. Operant is any behavior that's voluntary. So as opposed to classical conditioning, which looked at unconditioned um, responses like salivation or your body reacting to fear um, or uh, you know, reacting to emotional responses. He's looking at physical behavior um, change. So learning depends on what happens after the response or the consequence. <clears throat> so in other words, he said all voluntary behavior is a product of learning. Now he came up with what's called the Skinner box. The Skinner box basically put a rat in a box and um, there's a little lever and when it when they push a lever, they would get a little bit of a reinforcement. So the rat's learning to press the bar in the wall of the cage in order to get food. The uh, machine automatically delivered a few pellets at a time in, in, the, uh, in the food trough on the lower left. In some cases, the light on the top left might be turned on to indicate that pressing the bar will lead to food or warn of an impending shock delivered by the grate on the floor of the cage. Now, reinforcement is any event or stimulus that when following a response increases the probability that the response will occur again. The primary reinforcer is any reinforcer that's naturally reinforcing by meeting a biological need, such as hunger, thirst, or touch. So when the, the rat received a, a food pellet, that's a primary reinforcer because it, it, it reinforced a basic biological need of hunger. A secondary reinforcer is any reinforcer that becomes reinforcing after being paired with a primary reinforcer, such as praise, tokens, or gold star. Gold star. Um, if you think of the monetary system we have, uh, receiving money, um, that would also be a secondary reinforcer because with money you can buy um, food or drink or stuff like that. Um, so versus Compared to classical conditioning, uh, this involves what's called an antecedent stimuli paired with, or classical conditioning is an antecedent stimuli paired with conditions um, leading to a, cha a change, um, where operant conditioning involves some sort of behavior and then reinforcement. Okay, In other words, if I do this, I'll get this, which is reinforcement. In other words, um, the animal or the human may say, what's in it for me? If I get this, I get this. Okay. Positive reinforcement is reinforcement of response by addition or experience of a pleasurable stimulus. Okay. Negative reinforcement is, is a reinforcement of a response by the removal or escape from an avoidance of an unpleasant stimulus. For example, if I take aspirin for headache, that's a negatively reinforced by the removal of the headache. Okay, so let's say I, I go to work and I get paid. That's positive reinforcement, right? Or um, uh, let's say I my my kid does their chores. I give them um, a secondary reinforcer of money or an allowance at the end of the week. Um, that would be uh, positive reinforcement. Okay. Now, both these seem similar, but I want you to be able to tell the difference here between operant conditioning and classical conditioning. So classical conditioning 
The end result is the creation of a new response to a stimulus that did not normally produce that response, like salivation over when a metronome would play. Okay. Operant conditioning, the end result is an increase in the rate of an already occurring response. So let's say I want my kids to do their chores more. I give them positive praise and allowance, and then I see an increase in that behavior. Okay. Operant condition responses are voluntary, where classical conditions, the responses are involuntary, like body emotional reactions or salivation. Uh, operant condition, the consequences are important in forming association. Where in classical conditioning, the antecedent stimuli is important. Uh, what happens before the behavior, um, the, the unconditioned stimuli. Um, operant condition reinforcement needs to be immediately after the behavior. And classical conditioning, the conditioned stimulus has to occur immediately before the unconditioned stimulus. Operant condition is an expectancy develops for reinforcement to follow a correct response. Condi classical conditioning, there's an expectancy to develop for the unconditioned stimulus to follow the conditioned stimulus. Otherwise, it won't work. Next are schedules of reinforcement. Um, there's what's called continuous reinforcement, which is I reinforce with something positive every time there's a correct response. So let's say every time my son does the dishes, I reinforce with um, praise or I reinforce with a reminder that he's earning his allowance. Partial reinforcement is the response that's reinforced after some, but not all, correct responses. So I might only praise after one out of three or one out of five times he does the dishes. Um, and that tends to be very resistant to extinction. In other words, this one, um, they're less likely to have that behavior die out if I stop reinforcing it. Or continuous reinforcement becomes extinct faster because they expect that reward every time. Okay, there's a little video here that shows uh, schedules of reinforcement that we're going to cover next. Um, the fixed interval schedule of reinforcement is that's where um, there's a certain interval time that passes before um, they receive reinforcement. A variable inter interval of reinforcement is where the interval of time is, is variable. So um, they might get a reward or reinforcement every five minutes every one minute next, every two minutes, so the, the interval would, would change. Next is the fixed ratio schedule of reinforcement. The number of responses required for reinforcement is always the same. So every time a per, the, the animal or person does something, they get the reinforcement. Where the variable schedule of reinforcement happens uh, randomly. Okay, uh, I guess a good example of, of these two would be um, Let's see, um, when the number of responses required, um, well, let me show on the next slide. Um, notice in, in a fixed interval, um, let's say the, the mouse is in a box, and no matter how many times they press a lever, it's every two minutes they get, um, they get uh, a little food pellet. And notice a little drop in behavior. They, they start learning that, you know what, there's no point pushing that lever until after two minutes, and then I get rewarded. Right after I get rewarded, there's a drop in behavior. And then once two minutes passes, I start pushing the lever again, and I get rewarded on the fixed interval. On a variable interval, um, notice the, the, the number of responses increases because they don't know when they'll get rewarded again, and so they'll keep pushing that lever over and over expecting that positive reinforcement. A fixed ratio means every time I push the lever, I get a reward. Um, notice uh, the learning curve is a little bit higher. Okay, um, And then variable ratio, um, this is kind of like uh, they, your book talks about the one arm bandit or the slot machine. Um, it's the most reinforcing, which means I know that I might not get a reward every time, but if I get a big reward, it's going to be worth it. So, uh, um, and this is where uh, addiction may be high as well. So, if these four graphs show the typical pattern of responding for both fixed and variable interval and ratio schedules of reinforcement, the responses are cumulative, which means that new responses are added to those that come before. 
and all graphs begin after the learn pattern is well established. Now the slash marks mean that a reinforcement has been given. So in both the fixed interval and the fixed ratio graphs, there is a pause after each reinforcement after the learn, learner briefly rests. The scallop shape of the fixed interval curve is a typical indicator of this pause. These are the scallops here. Um, <clears throat> as a stair-step shape of the fixed ratio curve. In the variable interval and ratio schedules, no such pause occurs because the reinforcements are unpredictable. So notice that both fixed and variable interval schedules are slower, they're less steep, than the two ratio schedules because the need to respond as quickly as possible in the ratio schedules is more important. Next, let's talk about punishment. Now, punishment weakens the response where reinforcement will strengthen the response. Uh, punishment is any event or object that, when following a response, makes that response less likely to happen again. Punishment by application, the punishment of a response by the addition or experience of an unpleasant stimulus. So, for instance, um, spanking. A uh, child tries running out into the street, and a parent might swat their child on the bottom saying no don't do that you get yourself hurt so you hurt them on the bottom <laughs> but what is it does is it, it um, punishment by removal the punishment of a response by removable pleasurable stimulus is like if you take a put um, a person in time out or if you remove privileges or allowance um, that's removing uh, a pleasurable stimulus so that's punishment by removal um, so how do I modify behavior? Um, positive reinforcement is, is I'm adding something that's valued, okay? For instance, getting a gold star for good behavior in school, okay? Punishment is, um, is something unpleasant, but what I'll do is I'll do punishment by application, getting a spanking for disobeying or trying to run out in the street, okay? Um, negative reinforcement is removing something unpleasant. For instance, I avoid ticket by stopping at a red light or driving the speed limit. Um, so I'm avoiding the negative reinforcement. Um, so there's an increase of law abiding behavior because of um, removing that negative reinforcement. Where um, there's, there's something valued or desirable, uh, losing a privilege, such as going out with friends, that's punishment by removal. Now, a lot of people get this kind of confused here. Um, and it's important you be able to tell the difference. So, reinforcement has to do with having or taking away things they like. Or punishment is things we don't like. Okay. Um, positive is about directly... Um, affecting behavior, okay, like uh, clicking your seatbelt, making the sound go off, um, that would be an example of negative reinforcement. So I'm increasing a positive behavior um, by by clicking the, the um, putting on the seatbelt um, to avoid listening to that irritating sound. Okay, um, here's some examples of negative reinforcement, stopping a red light, to avoid getting an accident, mailing income tax return by April 15th to avoid paying a penalty, obeying a parent uh, before they reach a count of three to avoid getting a scolding or a, a consequence. Uh, an example of punishment by removal is losing the privilege of driving because you get into too many accidents, having to lose some of your money to pay the penalty for the tax filing, or being grounded um, for losing your freedom because of disobedience. So the negative reinforcement is choosing the positive behavior to avoid um, these consequences. The punishment is what, what happens after you, know, you made the, the negative behavior. Okay. Now let's talk about severe punishment. Now, you've probably heard the saying, uh, spoil the rod, spare the child. Um, no, it's a spare the rod, spoil the child, and then go backwards. Um, the negative things about punishment is it may stop the behavior immediately, and that's why a lot of parents are, tend to like using punishment.
However, um, it's a negative reinforcer for parents. In other words, it's, it, it takes away the negative behavior right away. So it's, it, it may encourage us to continue punishment. However, it may cause avoidance of the punisher instead of the behavior being punished. It may encourage lying to avoid punishment. It also creates fear, creates fear and anxiety. If a child is uh, um, punished, basically uh, you're telling the child what not to do, but you're not teaching uh, an effective alternative. It also creates anxiety in the child, which is really affects learning. It's not an effective learning strategy if you want your child to have um, long-term behavior change. Next, um, to, for punishment to be effective, it should immediately follow the behavior it's meant to punish. Um, now, if I can't punish the kid right away, I'll say, hey, wait till you go home, but there will be a consequence and there will be a discussion. Um, is immediately after the negative behavior. Um, punishment should be consistent. Um, punishment of wrong behavior should be paired wherever possible with reinforcement of the right behavior. Okay. Um, so, where am I? Okay. So you make sure you replace the negative behavior with some positive desired behavior. So let's say if a, a child is uh, cutting themselves, um, you want to reinforce. Uh, right behavior instead, which would be journaling or reaching out and talking about feelings instead of acting them out in negative ways. Next is a discriminative, discriminative stimulus, which is any stimulus such as a stop sign or doorknob that provides an organism with a cue for making a certain response in order to re obtain reinforcement. Um, so or to avoid a negative uh, reinforcement. Now, extinction occurs if the behavior response is not reinforced. So one way to deal with a child's temper tantrum is to ignore it. A lack of reinforcement for the tantrum behavior will eventually result in extinction. In other words, uh, if a child is uh, saying, I want a piece of candy, I want a piece of candy, I want a piece of candy, and they're having a little tantrum on the, in the grocery store floor, if you give them a piece of candy, you just rewarded the child for having a tantrum. What you got to do is you want that behavior to become extinct. You don't want tantrum behavior to increase. So the most important thing you do is do not reward a tantrum. So um, the key is to ignore it, to not give in to that tantrum. I remember telling my kids, when have you ever gotten what you want from having a tantrum? Never. The tantrum needs to stop. Um, eventually the behavior goes down. But if you reward it, the tantrums will will be um, increasing in your life. Uh, operantly conditioned responses also can be generalized to stimuli that are not only that are only similar, not identical to original stimulus. <clears throat> For instance, uh, saying um, data to all males uh, who fail to respond or reinforce will eventually only call the child will only call her dad, daddy. Okay, um, so they'll eventually generalize that stimuli. Spontaneous recovery. It's a reoccurrence of a once extinguished response. Also happens in operant conditions. Like classical conditioning, old learning sometimes returns and you have to go back to your own reinforcement schedule to change the behavior. Now shaping is when you have more complex, you're teaching a more complex skill and breaking it down to more simple steps leading to a desired complex behavior. Um, let's see, your book talks about shaping at the end of this chapter, they're um, um, teaching our cat how to um, use the toilet instead of the litter box. <laughs> Definitely a lot more shaping involved um, to teach that complex behavior. Uh, successive approximations are small steps, one after another, that leads to a particular goal behavior. Now, instinctive drift is a tendency for an animal's behavior to revert to genetically controlled patterns. So each animal comes into the world and the laboratory with certain genetically determined instinctive patterns of behavior already in place. Uh, and these instincts differ from species to species. There are some responses that simply cannot be trained into an animal. For instance, um, some of the uh, 
let's see, Keller and Marion uh, Brayland in 1961 tested raccoons and pigs, and they discovered that some, some animals are not a blank slate. They cannot be taught uh, certain behaviors. Raccoons commonly dunk their food in and out of water before eating. This washing behavior is controlled by instinct. It's difficult to change, even using operant techniques. So you can't teach a raccoon certain tricks because of their programming. Kind of the same thing as teaching uh, a orangutan or a chimpanzee uh, human language because um, their structures in their mind um, are limited to real simple sentences and not complex. Um, behavior modification is the use of operant conditioning techniques to bring about a desired change in behavior. Using token economy, that's a type of behavior modification which desired behavior is rewarded in tokens. Uh, for instance, if you go to any group home or a place like Boys Town, um, they cannot use physical punishment on a child and most of the kids have um, behavior disabilities or attention deficit and uh, behavior modification has proven to be very successful um, in, in changing behaviors. Um, so they would reward positive behavior with positive points which they can later use for um, privileges. They can cash in on privileges such as food, free time, watch, use of TV, use of cell phone. Um, another example of behavior modification is um, there's a little video here that talks about how I can modify my own behavior. First is you have to have what's called a target behavior. Um, you pick a behavior you want to change. Two, you want to choose a reinforcer. What would reinforce um, that behavior you want to change? So for instance, I want to start biking 30 minutes a day for three days a week. Um, that's my target behavior. I'll choose a reinforcer. It might be watching my favorite TV show. Um, and then put the plan to action, and, um, and that would be I would only watch my favorite TV show if I followed through with 30 minutes of riding a bike. And then uh, reward and ignore the, the negative. Um, it's probably good to start out with a fixed ratio of uh, reinforcement, and then maybe move on to a variable ratio. Timeout is also a, a form of behavior modification. By removing uh, the misbehaving animal, child, or adult, they're placed in a special way, area away from the attention of others. Um, so when you're removed from that positive reinforcement, it, it may, it may, it's basically a negative reinforcer. You're taking away a positive thing um, and hoping that um, that behavior decreases um, <clears throat> or the positive behavior increases. Um, Let's see, when you're doing time out with children, um, the rule of thumb is basically one minute maximum per year of age. So if you're dealing with a two year old, I wouldn't have time out more than two minutes um, because what they do is they forget why they're in time out after that amount of time. And time out should not uh, be more than 10 minutes. So if you have a nine or 10 year old, I'd say like, no more than 10 minutes. When they get older, timeouts aren't as effective. I would use privileges, withdrawing privileges um, as a form of behavior modification. Now, applied behavior analysis, or ABA, is a common term for a form of behavior modification that uses shaping techniques to mold a desired behavior. Um, here's a little concept map that can help you understand these terms a little bit better. But um, biofeedback, by the way, let's go back to this last one. Um, Behavior modification is where you, the skills are broken down into simple steps. You use what's called prompts or reminders of the steps for students that need a little help understanding the, the, the new skill. It's really effective with kids with behavior disabilities or kids with autism. These are kids that have disability difficulty with communicating or looking people at when they're talking to them. Um, they slowly can shape behavior through behavior modification and teach the desired behaviors to uh, these students with special needs. Um, biofeedback is the use of feedback about biological conditions to bring voluntary, involuntary responses, such as, as blood pressure or relaxation under voluntary control. Um, I used to have what's called a biofeedback monitor, which would measure galvanic skin response on your skin, and you would have uh, 
a little electrode hooked up to each finger. And uh, when you put yourself under a stressful situation, your fingers sweat and it would increase the uh, um, connection and uh, the tone would go up. And what I would do is I would teach students to use relaxation exercises um, to think of, um, use uh, meditation or um, focus on their breathing. And what it would do is their stress level would go down. The galvanic skin response would, would lower. Um, another strategy is um, neurofeedback, um, using devices such as uh, the EEG um, or the fMRI to provide feedback about brain activity in order to modify behavior. So um, by using an electroencephalograph, um, it can help kids with ADHD and also people with chronic pain in, in controlling, um, controlling their behavior or controlling or relaxing themselves in, in, in different situations. Now in the early days of learning, researchers' focus was on behavior. In the 1950s, and more intensely in the 1960s, many psychologists were becoming aware that cognition, the mental events that take place inside a person's mind during behavior, could no longer be ignored. In other words, it's not just um, behavior and reinforcement and a change of behavior. There's other things at play. Uh, Edward Talman, who was an early cognitive scientist, um, he's best known for experiments in learning involving teaching three groups of rats on the same maze, one at a time. Um, with, his um, with his experiment, um, he found out that rats were learning uh, the maze the first 10 days were just not motivated to find an exit. So he had group one, they rewarded each time they found the end of the maze. And they learned the maze quickly, and they, they learned quickly. Uh, the response time was the fastest. Uh, group two was in the maze every day, but he only rewarded them after 10 days. So for 10 days, they would just kind of wander around in the maze. And, and if they accidentally found their way out, they would, they would not receive a reward. Okay. What they found is after 10 days, they quickly learned how to find the exit. Is, so what it proved is they were learning even when they weren't being reinforced. Group three was a control group. They were never rewarded. Even after 10 days, they did not learn the maze well. So um, the term for group two that quickly learned, had that quick learning curve after 10 days of suddenly being reinforced, they found out that learning that remains hidden until its application becomes useful. So in other words, they weren't motivated before to find an exit, and as soon as it was, um, they were reinforced, they were motivated to quickly find that exit. They remembered the stuff they had, they did the previous 10 days. Okay, here's an optional learning, interactive experiment on latent learning. That's kind of interesting. Um, this shows the typical, the, the maze that the, the mice had to do. They, they started here, and the goal is for them to find the end box as fast as possible. Okay, this shows the learning curve for the um, control group, group three. They never received any reinforcement. Their number of errors really never decreased. It decreased a little bit, but not too much. This shows group one that had reinforcement every time. They learned the fastest. Okay, uh, however, group two, after 10 days, that learning crew, once they were reinforced, they learned very, very quick and actually surpassed group number one. So, um, so in the results of this classic study of latent learn, learning, group one was rewarded on each day while group two was rewarded for the first time on day 11. Group three was never rewarded. Um, note the immediate change of the behavior in group two. This is from uh, Tolman and Hanzik's study in 1930. Now the insight is a sudden perception of relationships among various parts of a problem, allowing the solution to come um, to the problem to come quickly. Um, Kohler, in his studies, he was actually uh, um, stranded at a, an island where they had um, um, chimpanzees that they were studying. And he found out um, that some of the chimpanzees, they had information that cannot be gained through trial and error learning alone. In other words, they had insight, an aha moment. Um, he knew that chimpanzees used tools, um, and Sultan used uh, a stick to achieve a banana that was out of reach. 
Um, what he found out is that the, the chimpanzee learned to attach um, two sticks together to retrieve the banana after trial and error, but also having these moments of insight. Um, and that's part of learning as well, the, the process of insight. Um, next, uh, Seligman, had a, uh, Martin Seligman in 1975, while doing um, experiments on dogs using classical conditioning, he came up with what's called learned helplessness. Uh, it was a tendency to fail to act, to escape from a situation because of a history of repeated failures. Um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later, but he um, coined the term positive psychology, which is a new way of looking at the entire concept of mental health and therapy that focuses on the adaptive, creative, and psychologically more fulfilling aspects of human experience rather than on mental disorders. So instead of focusing on the, the label, they would focus on the creativity and adaptivity to um, coping um, with the, the disability. Um, let's go back to learned helplessness. Um, this was one of the apparatus um, that Seligman used um, in the conditioning stage. Um, first, the dogs were um, harnessed where they're unable to escape and move to the other side of the box. Um, but what happened is uh, they paired a tone with an electric shock. Now, the dog was harnessed, so there was nothing the dog could do but experience the shock. Now, the shock wasn't lethal, but it was enough to make the dog feel uncomfortable. Okay. Um, eventually, what they did is uh, they removed the harness. Um, but what they found out is the dog did not escape even when escape was possible. So the dog believed they could not escape the shock, so they did not try. And now it's uh, learned helplessness. Um, in the control group, the dogs, when they experienced the shock, they jumped into the other side of the box because they weren't conditioned, learned helplessness. So in Segelman's studies of learned helplessness, dogs were placed in a two-sided box. Dogs that had no prior experience with being unable to um, escape a shock would quickly jump over the hurdle to the center of the box to land on the safe side. Dogs that previously learned that escape was impossible would stay on the side of the box in which a shock occurred, not even trying to go over the hurdle. Now this was applied to human beings um, to think about, you know, um, have humans after experiencing a lot of failure have given up um, in practice learned helplessness. Uh, how are, what are some things we can do to help uh, people overcome learned helplessness? Next is uh, Observational Learning by Bandura. In 1961, he started what's called Observational Learning, learning a new behavior by watching a model perform that behavior. So um, sometimes that behavior was positive, sometimes that behavior was negative. But learning performance distinction is learning can take place without an actual performance of the learned behavior. So let's, let me give an example. Um, Bandura's Bobo Dow experiment. First of all, uh, a child watched a model coming into the playroom and ignoring the Bobo Dow and playing um, and, and, and playing nicely without the Bobo Dow. The second um, experiment is where the children saw the bobo, the child, the model, um, you throw the bobo ball, punch it, and do all kinds of crazy things with it. In the first experiment, the children modeled what the kid, what they saw the kid do. They ignored the bobo doll and played nicely, nonviolently with the other toys. In the second experiment, the kids exactly did exactly what they saw the model do. Okay. Um, the next example is uh, they, um, they watched the model uh, reinforced for hitting the child or hitting the, the, the bobo doll. And what, they found in, what they found out in the example was the child did the same thing, okay? the child in the experiment that witnessed it. And the next example, they saw um, a child being punished for um, hitting the bobo doll. And what they did is they were less likely to do the same thing with the Bobo doll. However, when they asked to display what did that child get punished for, show me the behavior, the child obviously learned it and was able to show that behavior. So in this uh, Alberto's, Albert Bandura's famous Bobo doll experiment, the doll was used to demonstrate the 
impact of observing an adult model performing aggressive behavior on the later aggressive behavior of children. The children in these photos are imitating the adult model's behavior even though they believe they are alone and they're not being watched. Um, now, Bandura also found links between exposure to violence and media um, with aggressive behavior um, towards others. Uh, if you think about it, in the United States, uh, 8 to 18 year olds spend around seven and a half hours a day with media consumption. Um, just think of you know how that it does influence our behavior. Okay, next, um, Bandura coined these four learning elements that have to happen um, for observational learning. Um, one is attention. To learn anything through observation, the learner must first pay attention to the model. Two is memory. The learner must be able to retain the memory of what was done, such as remembering the steps in preparing a dish that was first seen on a cooking show. Um, if they're not able to return the, retain the memory, they won't be able to you know, remember and, and reproduce that behavior. Imitation is a learner must be able to be capable of reproducing or imitating the actions. For instance, a two-year-old does not have the de manual dexterity to tie his or her own shoe. So if she he or she watches someone tie their shoe at two years old, or if a two-year-old watches someone tying the shoe, they won't be able to learn it because they don't have the dexterity. Next is motivation. The learner must have the desire to perform the action. For instance, uh, if you try to teach potty training to um, a, a, a toddler before they're ready, if they're not motivated, they won't do it. Okay, next is applying psychology. Um, the last section of your book, they talk about shaping behavior. Uh, training a cat to use a toilet instead of the litter box. Um, the, you first start with shaping. You start moving the litter box towards the toilet and then uh, propping it up higher and higher next to the toilet. Uh, next is uh, preparing the training area. You have to have the lid up, the seat down, uh, the door open. That's important to make that available. Next is uh, positive reinforcement on a variable schedule. Uh, it's important not to use a fixed ratio, otherwise the, the cat will um, experience extinction of that behavior because they're not being re reinforced uh, randomly, which is the most effective way of changing behavior. That concludes this session. Uh, have a great week.